My name is Peter Matheson. I have the honour of being the Principal of the University of Edinburgh and it's a particular pleasure to be welcoming people to coming to the University because I haven't been doing very much of that for the last uh, 18 months or so. This is actually the first public lecture that I've hosted for 18 months whereas before that it was quite an important part of my duty. So anyway, um, I'm very grateful to those of you that are uh, from some other part of the University or from outside the University for for being here, and I'm particularly grateful to our speaker and, uh, and Luan who, for, for being here, and I'll say a bit more about our speaker very briefly in a second. But um, if you're here, it's because you understand the significance of the Gifford Lecture Series. Um, uh, we are very proud to host these series of lectures here, and uh, you'll know there are parallel series in other universities around the place, and um, uh, they are a series of lectures that I think are unique in some ways, and they're taken very seriously by the people that are invited to speak. They're regarded as a prestigious and an important contribution to dialogue on a particular set of subjects. And they're also taken very seriously, I think, by the hosts. In this case, it's the University of Edinburgh and me, but wherever they're being hosted. And I think they're also taken very seriously by the audiences. So um, we, we depend on um, a public audience coming and making the, the university series, making the lecture series a success. So for all of those uh, reasons, uh, I'm very grateful to those to those present. Um, this evening's uh, lecturer is uh, Professor David Hempton. Some of you will have already heard some of the earlier lectures in the series, and you'll have heard him introduced, and I don't propose to uh, repeat the introduction, but David is a senior professor and dean of the University of Harvard Divinity School. Um, and, uh, and Luanne is with him, has the distinction of being a University of Edinburgh alumna. So uh, to both of you, welcome back to these shores. I know. Um, other universities are available, and David graduated from another university not very far north of here. Um, but, uh, but anyway, you're both very welcome back to the UK. And I was just briefly hearing the beginning there that this is the first major international trip that you've made in a period of time as well. So we're very grateful that Edinburgh is the, the first uh, of, 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 your, of your destinations to be able to receive you post-pandemic, as it were, or peri-pandemic, whichever way you want to use the terminology. So the theme of the lectures, as you all know, is Networks, Nodes and Nuclei in the History of Christianity, circa 1500 to 2020. Um, and this evening's uh, lecture is the fourth of the six lectures and is entitled The Protestant International Pietism, Premillennialism and Pentecostalism. Gosh, I'm pleased with myself for getting those out. Um, uh, but, but thank you very much for, for, uh, for, for coming and thank you to David for delivering the lecture. Just two uh, brief words of sort of housekeeping. Um, the regulations that in Scotland still pertain is that you should wear a mask unless you're exempt um, uh, and you should respect people's social distance, but it's not actually a, a firm requirement. But, but generally, I think whilst uh, we're in a group like this that's not socially distanced, if you're able to continue to wear your mask, I'd encourage you to do so. Um, uh, the, the, uh, unfortunately, this, this has become a bit of a, the way of our lives. Um, uh, we, um, at the end of the lecture, there is time for questions. Uh, and uh, when, you, uh, when you get the opportunity to ask a question, if you would wait for the microphone, because we are recording it, so we want the soundtrack to be uh, audible to all, and if you'd identify yourself, and if you'd keep your questions brief, uh, that would be very helpful. Um, uh, and uh, the lecture, uh, the, the recording of the lecture, um, will be available on the university's Gifford Lectures webpage and blog afterwards if you want to revisit it or tell anybody else about it. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass over to... Um, Professor David Hempston, welcome David back to the University of Edinburgh again and thank you for giving us the fourth lecture in your series. Thanks so much for that uh, nice welcome and um, thanks so much just for the uh, hospitality of the University of Edinburgh which has been uh, outstanding. Um, and thank you especially to um, you, the audience members, uh, either here or uh, watching the very nicely done recordings. Uh, uh, so wherever you are, uh, thanks for uh, 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 being with us tonight. So the aim of this lecture is to apply our general organizing principle and method, networks, nodes and nuclei, to some of the most significant developments in the English-speaking Protestant world in the past four centuries including the transition from pietism to evangelicalism, the explosive growth of Protestant missions, the origins of premillennial dispensationalism and its contribution to the rise of fundamentalism, which has had a big impact on American culture and politics 
And finally, the worldwide spread of Pentecostalism. Um, no one quite knows how many Pentecostals there are in the world, but it's probably not too far shy of um, uh, uh, half a billion. Um, and um, uh, if you add charismatic Christians into that, we're talking about a very large slice of the Christian population of, of the world. None of these developments can be studied within a single denominational or national tradition, and none can be understood without coming to terms with their nucleus of ideas, theologies, the nodal points of their transmission and dissemination, and the transnational networks that facilitated their growth. I am grouping these world-changing developments under the general heading of the Protestant International, though, mo though mobility, diversity, and fragmentation are central components. I wish to make clear at the outset that there are other possible ways of constructing the Protestant International, such as, those, uh, such as that presented by Kathleen Carte in her recent book on Imperial Protestantism, which states that, quote, before the American Revolution divided it, an interlocking system of religious networks, societies, and communities connected distant Protestants of one another across the British Empire. Important though those networks were, my intention is less on networks attached to institutions and governments, um, including imperial governments. So my attention is less on institutional history, if you like, and more on the populist energies of what she calls awakened Protestants, whose stories are still much less well known and I think more important. I begin with a personal story. It is a decade since the passing of William Reginald Ward, um, arguably the greatest historian of the Protestant International. I first came across Professor Ward's work as a young graduate student in St. Andrews University, almost at the beginning of his prolific 30 years war of writing religious history, in opposition to what he, what he considered to be the then dominant paradigms constructed by Anglican chauvinists, Marxist reductionists, sentimental religious ecumenists, and paro parochial Anglo-American religious historians. He didn't like any of those four categories very much. <laughs> Although he had already built a distinguished career as a historian of other subjects, his book on religion and society in England, 1790-1850, published in 1972, just uh, on the eve of my own graduate studies, was his first serious foray into the world of popular evangelicalism, and what a foray it turned out to be. I can still remember its first sentence, which dropped off the page like an intellectual time bomb. The generation overshadowed by the French Revolution, he wrote, was the most important generation in the modern history, not only of English religion, but of most of the Christian world. For the revolution altered forever the terms in which religious establishments the chief device in which the nations of the West had relied for Christianizing the people must work. So this is a big statement, really, that that French Revolutionary era really transformed um, the history of Christianity. Ward's thesis was that by 1790, a non-denominational evangelical Protestantism with Methodism in the leading role and influenced by Enlightenment ideas was poised to reshape the old denominational order in nations right across the North Atlantic world and far beyond. This prospect was destroyed in the British Isles, but not in the United States, by the French Revolution, which assigned religion the role of keeping social order in very desperate times. In Britain, the Methodists, with Jabez Bunting at the helm, cozied up to the established order and inexorably quenched the revival, while in the United States, populist evangelicals of all stripes literally did fa refashion the old denominational order, the consequences of which for the new republic in the United States should not be underestimated. Ward's book was a time bomb because in his swashbuckling style, he cut the ground from under both E.P. Thompson's portrayal of Methodism as a proletarian disease, and Owen Chadwick's magisterial but smugly Anglican airbrushing of English religion during the Industrial Revolution. Ward's chosen vantage point from which to look at religion in the age of revolutions was not through the intellectual elites of London, Berlin, or Paris, but rather the evangelical working class radicals of Manchester, the first great shock city of the Industrial Revolution. Since writing that book, it's almost as if Ward placed the point of his compass in the dark satanic mills of the north of England and started to draw a series of ever-widening geographical and chronological circles that took him back in time and far beyond the shores of the British Isles. 
in a string of important books and equally important but less well-known articles, Ward, the self-confessed old primitive Methodist ranter, traveled in search of the roots of evangelical Protestantism, the, the reasons for its spectacular early successes, and in his opinion, its rather sorry condition by the end of the 19th century. He constructed a trilogy of breathtaking intellectual scope and depth, beginning with the Protestant evangelical awakening, followed by Christianity under the Ancien Regime, and completed by early evangelicalism, a global intellectual history. The main argument of this trilogy is that in Europe after Westphalia, religion was too important a matter to be left entirely to the churches. Most rulers before the late 18th century regarded religious toleration as a sign of state weakness and relied principally upon established churches to enforce conformity and keep good order. But the established churches, which had worked so hard for their place in the political sun, soon found themselves in unexpected difficulties. Some rulers coveted their wealth, while the churches themselves struggled, unsuccessfully as it happened, to find sufficient resources to cope with rapidly expanding populations. Disappointed mutual expectations resulted in, in clashes between religious and secular authorities, which were played out with equal bitterness in many different regions, from the disputes over patronage in Scotland to the almost relentless sniping between French kings and the papacy throughout the period. The inability of established churches to align their resources with their objectives or to eradicate popular superstition left them creaking audibly in the generation after the Seven Years' War. Creaking became groaning in the 1790s when the revolutionaries summarily dealt with the French church and the English church began to lose its affinity with national sentiment that had once been its glory. Although it took time for the various historical processes to play out, Established churches everywhere, including the Celtic fringes of the British Isles, would never be the same again. Meanwhile, a new and dynamic religious movement, evangelical revivalism, was helping to transform the Protestant interest of post-Reformation states and dynasties into a Protestant international, which did not depend on support from established churches and church and state. Revivalism in the Habsburg land was the response of pious minorities who had to achieve quick results or else go under often with no time to wait for church renewal, or more likely with no institutional church to renew. Moravians, Silesians, Salzburgers pioneered new forms of popular Protestantism and exported them to Western Europe and then to the New World. Class meetings began with Spain in 1670. Camp meetings originated with the Swedish army in Silesia <clears throat> in the early 18th century. And itinerant preaching developed as a survival strategy for pietist communities. All was accompanied by a phenomenal increase in hymn writing and by revivals instituted and conducted by children. The money behind the expansion came from the commercial exploitation of medicaments, Bibles and religious literature, <clears throat> and from the availability of Dutch credit at low rates of interest. Indeed, Ward was one of the few historians to take seriously the importance of the financing of religious venture ventures. How money was raised, how it was spent, including debt retirement, is a vital but still under researched aspect of religious history. It is perhaps at Ward's most important achievement to show that whereas established churches were creaking from accumulated lethargy, Protestant Christianity, at least for a few generations, exhibited astonishing new vigor by going over wholesale to unconfessional, international, societary means of action in which the laity paid for and often ran great machines which had no place in the traditional church orders. From Methodism to the great Protestant missionary societies of the 19th century, the pietism of a mobilized laity achieved remarkable feats of gospel transmission through voluntary networks across the transatlantic world and, and, uh, and beyond. The third and last book of Ward's trilogy focused on the intellectual and cultural origins of evangelicalism and on the core of evangelical identity, or what I am calling the nucleus in our parlance which characterized all the major strands of evangelicalism from Halle in the East to, Nor to Northampton, Massachusetts in the West, and with all the many stops in between. Though often bitterly divided over belief and practice, evangelical Protestants nevertheless constructed a global fraternity around a number of important themes. These themes, the close association with mysticism, the small group religion, 
the deferred eschatology, the experimental approach to conversion, anti-Aristotelianism, and hostility to theological systems, and the attempt to reinforce religious vitality by setting it in the context of a vitalist understanding of nature, formed a sort of evangelical hexagon lasting until the original evangelical cohesion began to fall apart. By the end of the 19th century, a less expansive evangelicalism emerged, this time constructed around biblical inerrancy, premillennial dispensationalism, propositional systems of all kinds, and bureaucratic denominationalism. An infallible text read with wooden literalism, an instant millennium, an absence of mystery, a lack of interest in nature, priestly personality cults, and modernist soteriological systems, according to Ward, were not what the early evangelicals had in mind. What Ward has shown is that what we call evangelicalism arose out of a quite specific historical context in post-30 years war Europe, drew from a surprising eclectic intellectual culture, coalesced for a time around a number of important shapers or themes, which um, uh, was disseminated internationally through sweeping population movements and by rev revivalists who knew of each other's labors and changed over time and from place to place as a result of social and intellectual pressures. So the essence of Ward's argument is that in the period between Westphalia settlement and the French Revolution, state persecution, sweeping population movements, the rise of voluntary organizations, and the pastoral and political limitations of established churches produced major changes in transnational Protestantism from the Urals in the East to the Appalachians in the West. The era of the French Revolution exhilarated those changes and gave them an even wider geographical salience. A prime example was the growth of Protestant interest in converting the wider world. The period between 1790 and 1815 saw the formation of a remarkable wave of new Protestant missionary societies. The Baptist Missionary Society, the London Missionary Society, the Edinburgh the Scottish Missionary Society, the Glasgow Missionary Society, the Society for Missions to Africa and the East, um, later known as the Church Missionary Society, and the Wesleyan Methodist Missionary Society. All of these um, societies formed between uh, 1792 and 1813. The British societies also connected with a host of continental European missionary societies with Lutheran, Reformed and Moravian roots in Germany, Switzerland and the Netherlands. Across the Atlantic, the formation of the London Missionary Society led directly to the formation of the New York Missionary Society and its sister organization, the Northern Missionary Society in the state of New York. So these missionary societies in Britain were followed by a flurry of new missionary organizations in the United States, a whole bunch of them. Here are some examples. Um, the Berkshire and Columbia Mission Society, state of Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, um, Presbyterian Standing Commission, and so on and so on. Exactly the same periods. 1790s, 1810s, and 20s. The American societies were mostly Congregational, Presbyterian, and Baptist, and located in New England, and they initially concentrated their attention on frontier church planting and Indian missions. Despite the limited geographical range of their work, the members of these societies understood themselves to be particip participating in a worldwide missionary movement of the spirit, and the American missionary periodicals frequently published missionary intelligence from Europe, so they knew about each other's work and what was going on. The sheer scale of this voluntaristic surge of interest in missions across the globe, replete with their subscription lists, missionary intelligence, prayer networks, female auxiliaries, widely distributed pamphlets, in such a short space of time, takes some explaining. In part, those networks were constructed on top of or influenced by earlier traditions, especially the remarkable the remarkably influential missionary exploits of the Halle Pietists and the Moravians. The Moravians had been active in international missions since the 1730s. They were real pioneers and were important connectors with um, other evangelicals in the 1780s and 90s through their writings on missions and the publication of the quarterly periodical accounts in the spring of 1790 which was the first missionary journal to appear at regular intervals and to be devoted entirely to missionary news. The periodical accounts circulated widely among leaders of all the other missionary societies and made its way across the Atlantic through pre-existing Moravian settlements and networks. 
However important the Moravians were as catalysts of other Protestant uh, missionary ventures, there were many other factors contributing to the growth of interest in international missions. The French Revolution provoked both alarm and excitement for British and European Protestants, alternatively pleased with a potentially fatal blow struck at the French Catholic Church and the fear of the spread of revolutionary Jacobinism as Napoleon's armies marched across Europe. It is striking how often continental missionary societies were either started or revitalized by the incipient approach of French troops. In this way, the Protestant Missionary International was an alternative global ideology, a rival cosmopolitanism with its metropolitan base in London and soon New York, an alternative to the rights of man with its metropolitan centre in Paris. There were, of course, other factors at play in London's emergence as an important node in the Protestant Missionary International. The growing influence of evangelicals in British public life coincided with and partly created deep unease about sin and virtue in Britain's emerging empire in India and with the nation's participation in the transatlantic slave trade. Not surprisingly, with such profound issues at stake, the surge of interest in missions was accompanied by a parallel surge of interest in Biblicist millennialism, of both the optimistic variety, emphasizing the millennial advent, advance of the gospel, and also a more pessimistic but equally energetic premillennial version that interpreted the signs of the times as so grim that only the returning Christ could save the godly from further trials and tribulations. In different ways, as either ushering in a global harvest of souls right across the world, or urgently rescuing a remnant for the returning Christ, missions stood to benefit from both. In the era of the French Revolution, British, continental European, and American evangelical Protestants mobilized an army of voluntary networks with nodes in London, Basel, Berlin, New York, and Boston to propagate the gospel across the world and resist the evils of Jacobinism, slavery, Romanism, and infidelity. In Britain and Europe, success was to be measured in the confrontation with revolutionary France and at the edges of empire in the American Republic, the destiny of the new nation was to be decided in the West among Western settlers and Indians. The stakes for the Protestant International could hardly have been higher or its geographical scope more extensive. It could appeal simultaneously to national renewal and international transformation. At the same time as the Protestant global missionary mobilization was taking place, and for some of the same reasons, including heightened anxiety provoked by the age of revolutions, especially the French, another dimension to the Protestant international was taking shape with equally important consequences, namely the remarkable prolifer proliferation of interest in apocalypticism. It's well known that the generation overshadowed by the French Revolution throughout the Protestant world began ransacking their scriptures for apocalyptic clues about the end times, and that millenarianism of all hues from Millerites, Mormons, and Adventists in the United States to predominantly established church evangelicals and popular enthusiasts in the British Isles, they displayed an unprecedented interest in biblical prophecy. Of course, interest in the end times, including a new interest in what was to be the fate of the Jews and the various ways of interpreting the second coming of Jesus and the biblical millennium, were not new features of the Christian tradition in the early 19th century. What was new was the transatlantic proliferation of prophecy conferences, periodicals, and publications devoted to parsing out the biblical prophecies and relating them to actual historical events, past, present, and future. In addition, this generic interest in apocalypticism morphed over time into a coherent theological system which was successfully disseminated across the North Atlantic world and became an important component of what later became known as fundamentalism. At stake here is no mere passing interest in esoteric and exotic biblicist fantasies, but rather the uncovering of one of the most powerful cultural shapers of the American Republic. For example, a recent book on religion and the rise of capitalism by a very eminent um, uh, Harvard economist devotes considerable space to elucidating, elucidating the importance of the 19th century conflict between post and premillennialism and explains its long-term consequences for ideas about economic progress, 
and later the fusion of conservative, religious, political, and economic worldviews in modern America. So Ben Friedman, the author of this book, is really making an important plea uh, to understanding the theological roots of conservative religious, conservative political, and conservative economic worldviews, which have done a lot to shape American culture. His basic argument is that the economic ideas constructed by Adam Smith, with its self-contained dynamic theory about how an economy advances from one way of meeting human needs to the next, was really strikingly congruent with the post-millennialist thinking put for forward by a series of English theologians over the prior two centuries. In short, Smith's conceptions of economic advance were developed at a time and a place when trends in theology were moving away from predestinarian Calvinism with its emphasis on human depravity and were consonant with post-millennial views of human agency and progress and more di uh, dynamic economic views. The, the organizing framework of these lectures, namely nuclei, nodes, and networks in the transmission of religious ideas, movements, and cultures, is especially useful for understanding the roots and transnational dissemination of apocalyptic theologies and ideologies. As Ernest Sandin pointed out in a path-breaking book half a century ago, there were multiple streams of apocalypticism in Britain and the United States in the first third of the 19th century. But what he called the basic tenets of the millenarian creed were held with surprising unanimity. The belief that acceptance of the divine authority of scripture required that the believer expect a literal rather than a spiritual fulfillment of the prophecies. The belief that the gospel was not intended to, nor was it going to accomplish the salvation of the world, but that instead the world was growing increasingly corrupt and rushing towards the imminent judgment. The belief that Christ would literally return to this earth the Jews would be restored to Palestine before the commencement of the millennial age. And above all, all this was discoverable by sincere believers from careful readings of the scriptures. Stating what was shared, however, should not diminish the importance of what was not shared. Although there were countless variations played out in the ubiquitous millenarian publications and periodicals, there was a fundamental division between more optimistic post-millennialists and more pessimistic, though intensely energized, premillennialists, and within the latter category between historicists and futurists. Historicists believed that the biblical prophecies contained in the books of Daniel and Revelation were connected and that most of these prophecies had already been fulfilled, while futurists believed that none of the events predicted in the book of Revelation had yet been fulfilled. This may seem a distinction without a difference, but the difference was that many of the premillennial historicists of the 19th century, including William Miller in the United States, specialized not only in matching the biblical days and years to real historical events, but on the basis of their calculations came up with quite specific dates for the physical second coming of Jesus. David Morgan has shown how Millerites and others built on earlier traditions of prophetic images to construct elaborate charts, literally mapping time and these were widely disseminated in the Jacksonian age of explosive growth of newspapers, periodicals, handbills, and, and broadsides. You can see from this particularly elaborate um, prophetical plan at the bottom um, uh, just how um, um, creative um, and, and all of these circles are mapping out epochs in the history of time and civilization. Adventist charts like this brought together in accessible form the aesthetic power of images, the sacrosanct authority of the Bible, a vivid interpretation and organization of historical events, and a place for devoted followers to find meaning and significance within the great scope of human history and eternity. <clears throat> but as all historians know, interpreting the past is one thing, predicting the future is quite another. And as we all now know, all of the predicted dates for the second coming including the Millerites and many others on both sides of the Atlantic, turned out to be wrong, um, good job for all of us, or in serious need of tweaking. Not surprisingly, therefore, over the course of the 19th century, premillennial historicists gradually gave way to futurists whose temporal claims lay in the future and therefore could not be so easily falsified. One particular strand of premillennialism, the dispensational scheme incorporating the future rapture of the saints, <coughs> 
constructed by the Anglo-Irish clergyman John Nelson Darby, has had a cultural impact way beyond its quite humble roots. The node or the inception site in this unlikely story is County Wicklow and South County Dublin in the 1820s and 30s, when a group of evangelical Church of Ireland clergymen, with the help of aristocratic and gentry patronage, organized conferences on biblical prophecy on the Powers Court estate uh, just outside Dublin. The context is really important. It was already clear that the so-called Second Reformation movement of the 1820s to convert Irish Catholics to Protestantism had largely failed, and it had become obvious from Daniel O'Connell's campaign for Catholic emancipation that the Anglo-Irish Protestant ascendancy was living on borrowed time. Not surprisingly, a political and clerical caste aware of its own impending defeat, but still persuaded of the truth of its Protestant religious um, tradition, looked to the sacred text for guidance and direction. Apocalyptic speculation in times of stress and strain, of course, is not a new feature of the Christian tradition. What was new about Ireland in the 1830s was the emergence of a particularly forceful and energetic personality, John Nelson Darby, who constructed an imaginatively compelling history of time, past, present, and future, shaped by a literalist interpretation of the Bible. What were those ideas? According to Donald Akinson in two recent books on the Darbyite phenomenon, Discovering the End of Time and Exporting the Rapture, Darby and his coterie of Wicklow Dublin supporters brought together a rigorous re-examination of biblical prophecies with a set of historical and contemporary observations about the dismal state of the Protestant churches and constructed a fecund constellation of ideas, beliefs, and practices that came to have a disproportionate influence on transatlantic evangelicalism. These included a revolutionary framing of, reframing of theology based on an extremely literalistic reading of big swaths of the Bible that Orthodox churches had traditionally read allegorically, a belief that Jesus would physically appear on earth, an interpretation of biblical prophecy that affirmed it to, to be, when read properly, a precise roadmap of uh, how things would happen from Jesus' return deep into eternity. In that mode, Darby affirmed the secret rapture of the saints, took a literal view of the tribulation, Armageddon, and the millennium. This was both imaginatively inventive and deeply conservative, that is, rooted in ancient scriptural texts. It was a compelling story of a divine and human drama, not a theological treatise um, difficult to uh, access. It was a way of ordering time from creation to the last judgment, a way of repivoting Christian and human history, away from the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus to some future rapture and second advent. According to Akinson, Darby and his colleagues were attempting nothing less than a rearrangement of two of Western culture's fundamental texts, the Hebrew and Christian scriptures. Eventually, they melded together the two texts in totally new ways, so different from previous arrangements as to constitute a new Bible. If the note of, in this story was the coterie of radical Irish evangelicals in Southern Ireland in the 1820s and 30s, and the nucleus is the emerging dispensational premillennial scheme of human history and human destiny, then networks of transmission still await rigorous historical treatment. The Wakenson has supplied a roadmap from the life of tra and travels of Darby himself. The peripatetic Darby, though mostly located in southern England from the later 1830s, made frequent journeys to the Protestant environs of Western Europe, mostly Switzerland, France, and Germany. Moreover, since the Darbyite construction was as much ecclesio ecclesiological as it was theological, the network of exclusive brethren and brethren assemblies became delivery mechanism um, of the new radical ideas. Darby himself visited North America seven times, as coincidentally did George Whitfield, comprising nearly seven years in all. Beginning first in the Great Lakes region of Canada and the United States, he later moved on to the great Midwestern and East Coast cities, Missionary journeys were augmented by prophecy and Bible conferences, some of which were inspired by Darby, such as Guelph and Ontario, and others with more generic biblicist and millenarian origins, such as those at Mild May in England, Northfield and Niagara in North America, and countless others. The significance of the conferences and Bible institutes are that they allowed transatlantic, almost exclusively male, evangelical networks to come together in ways that traditional denominations did not easily permit,
planning committees, conference speakers, correspondence networks, editorial boards, and coherent around systems of prophetical ideas um, based on scriptural exegesis and cultural analysis, all sustained coteries of ministers and laymen in many different denominations and in multiple towns and cities throughout the British Isles and North America. In the US, these networks were transdenominational, transcended social class, were not confined to specific regions, and were predominantly comprised of white males who had the resources and the know-how to travel. Influential books and the more durable peri periodicals kept the prophetical ideas moving along the networks. Bishop Eliot's Hora Apocalypticae, published in 1844. The Theological and Literary Journal was first published in 1848 by Horatio Bonner, or, or in 1848. Horatio Bonner's Quarterly Journal of Prophecy first appeared in 1849, and the Prophetic Times, a monthly periodical, began in 1863. These were among the most influential, but there were scores of others, not to mention the prophetical items in many of the specifically denominational periodicals. Most of the circulating literature and prophecy was premillennial, and increasingly futurist, with ongoing controversy around Darby dispensationalism. Darby's ideas were given a massive boost by the publication of the Schofield Reference Bible in 1909, still, I believe, the best-selling Oxford, Oxford University Press book of all time, which popularized and democratized the, pre the premillennial dispensational scheme in accessible form. Moving into the later 20th century, Hal Lindsay's immensely popular The Late Great Planet Earth and the Left Behind novels, which have collectively sold over 60 million copies, delivered premillennial dispensationalism into the populist bloodstream of American evangelical Protestantism with incalculable consequences for the religious, political, and cultural history of the nation. Different, difficult to overestimate the power of this in the shaping of American political culture. Immersing oneself in this biblical, literalist, prophetical literature, it's hard to resist the conclusion that it operated as a kind of male English-speaking book club, with the Bible as the book and the prophecies operating as clues to unlocking the secret history of time. The cultural charge many brought to this transatlantic club was a deep-seated pessimism about what was happening in the world around them, not always without foundation, together with an equally deep-seated sense of chosen destiny as saints armed with the right keys to unlock the mysteries from which they and they alone would be the ultimate beneficiaries. Such views often produced urgency and activism as well as, being, as well as a sense of being part of a divine plan accessible only to faithful students of biblical prophecies. And there is, I think, a link between this and the conspiracy theories and um, that are, um, uh, you know, very uh, uh, rampant now in the United States around the um, yeah, post-Trump election. Naturally, critics, both within the existing Protestant denominations and even more stringently those outside, thought very differently. Among the most savage of the critics was George Eliot, who vented her spleen on a Scotsman, Dr. Cumming, the minister of the Crown Court Ch Presbyterian Church in London, um, Cumming authored over a hundred books, most of them in, in prophetical and millennial themes. Um, and this is George Eliot uh, from a, an, a, an anonymous essay she produced in the uh, Westminster Review, but she wrote it. You might as well attempt to educate a child's sense of beauty by hanging its nursery with the horrible and grotesque pictures in which the early painters represented the Last Judgment, as expect Christian graces to flourish on that prophetic interpretation which Dr. Cumming offers as the principal nutriment of his flock. Advertising the premillennial advent is simply the transportation of political passions onto a so-called religious platform. It's the anticipation of the triumph of our party, accomplished by our principal men being sent for into the clouds. It would be idle to consider Dr. Cumming's theory of prophecy in any other light as a philosophy of history or as a specimen of biblical interpretation. It bears about the same relation to the extension of genuine knowledge as the astrological house in the heavens bears to the true structure and relations of the universe. Um, so Eliot's criticism of coming theological worldview is an, er an early example of modernist distaste for the kind of fundamentalism that grew out of premillennial and dispensational apocalypticism 
This distaste between elites and populace around things like this is still a major part of American culture. The roots of American fundamentalism are deep and extensive long before the publication of the fundamentals between 1910 and 1915 and the formation of the World's Christian Fundamentals Association in Philadelphia in 1919. So these fundamentals, um, 12 volumes, were produced between 1910 and 1915. They encompass resistance to the three R's of rationalism, Romanism, and ritualism, hostile to modernism, theological liberalism, and biblical criticism, with forebodings of the threats posed by scientific naturalism, especially Darwinism, and urbanization, anxiety about heresies from within, and finally, fear of the international challenges of ecumenism, socialism, and communism. This is what gave the, uh, its cultural charge. The strand that we have followed from the generation overshadowed by the American and French revolutions to the early 20th century, dispensational premillennialism, is a major part of the story. According to George Marston, a powerful group of leaders emerged in the later decades of the 19th century, including Dwight Moody, Reuben Torrey, C.I. Schofield, William Erdman, A.J. Gordon, who gave institutional permanence to the dispensational movement through the new Bible Institutes, such as the Moody Bible Institute, the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, and the Philadelphia College of the Bible. These um, major mega Bible Institutes um, had a big impact uh, also in American popular Protestantism. Marston writes that the network of related institutes that since sprang up became the nucleus for much of the fundamentalist movement of the 20th century. Not all fundamentalists in the 1920s and beyond were premillennial dispensationalists, but all premillennial dispensationalists were fundamentalists. And although beyond the scope of this lecture, it's hard to overstate the influence of fundamentalism on American evangelicalism, especially in the southern states after World War II and especially after 1960. It's equally hard to understate the impact of that reformulated evangelicalism on the culture and political history of the United States and the rise of the moral majority movement from the election of Ronald Reagan to the election of Donald Trump and to the evolution of the American Republican Party. Some of the same structural forces that were at work in producing premillennial dispensationalism and later fundamentalism were also operational in the emergence of probably the most important movement of Christianity since the Reformation, Pentecostalism. Indeed, one of the most influential contributors to the writings and conferences on prophecy in the 1820s was another Scotsman, Edward Irving, the Scottish minister of the Caledonian Chapel in London, who found himself at the center of controversy in 1831 after the apparent manifestation of the, of the apostolic gift of tongue speaking in his church. Prior to that, there had been somewhat episodic reports of miraculous healing and tongue speaking in parts of Western Scotland in 1830, persuading Irving that the long anticipated outpouring of the gifts of the Holy Spirit was finally at hand. Now, space doesn't permit a review of Irving's meteoric and controversial career, which led to a heresy trial and an early death in 1834. But Irving anticipated by over half a century the Pentecostal explosion of the early 20th century. The question is to what extent is this most recent expression of the Protestant International amenable to explanations from our organizing principles of networks, nodes, and nuclei? Let's start at the beginning. Grant Wacker and the best treatment of early Pentecostalism in American culture locates the origins of American Pentecostalism in four streams that had been flowing through the American religious landscape for many decades. Quote, partisans channeled each of these theological streams. They were personal salvation, Holy Ghost baptism, divine healing, and dispensational premillennialism. And they distributed these ideas through a vast institutional network. That network included conferences, summer camps, books, magazines, colleges, Bible institutes, and a web of national, regional, and local associations. In short, the rise of Pentecostalism is unintelligible without a grasp of the full extent of the networks created by radical evangelical subcultures out of which it emerged at the beginning of the 20th century. These networks operated before, during, and after instances of Pentecostal awakenings and help explain their transmission beyond a single site 
or even a single country to a worldwide phenomenon. As for the nucleus of Pentecostalism, most were located in the experience of Holy Spirit baptism and the spiritual gifts accompanying it. But Wacker, while not denying the centrality of spirit baptism, finds the essence of Pentecostalism in a combination of what he calls primitivism and pragmatism, a direct, unfiltered experience of divine power and intimacy on the one hand, and a realistic grasp of temporal realities and necessities on the other. This is something that we've noticed before in these lectures and these popular movements, that they, um, they combine both um, highly pragmatic views of technology and transmission with um, what some theologians might recall or uh, uh, um, uh, describe as, as fairly primitive uh, ideas. What then of the nodes or junction boxes of Pentecostal transmission, which of course raises controversial issues of historical origins and American Western imperialism? My framing metaphor and analytical framework is borrowed from one of the most empathetic and insightful books on global Pentecostalism, David Martin's uh, Pentecostalism, The World Their Parish. In his first chapter, and this is a really interesting phenomenon because Martin uh, you know, had already been the author of a general theory of secularization, which is probably the most influential theory of secularization um, around about you know, the 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, and then started to work with his spouse um, on, uh, on Pentecostalism and began to change his mind about some aspects of, of what he thought were um, uh, inexorable secularizing uh, uh, trajectories. In the first chapter of his book, entitled The Cultural Revolution, Martin traces the origins of Pentecostalism to the unsponsored mobilizations <coughs> of laissez-faire lay religion running to and fro between Britain and North America, especially between their respective unruly margins. He sees this moving from the margins all the time in Ulster, Cornwall, Scotland, Wales, Kentucky, Kansas, Texas, and finally California. He suggests that through these trails, American experiential religion marched alongside American modernization and produced a potent variable capable of stomping alongside modernization worldwide, so not uh, necessarily in, uh, in resistance to modernization, but alongside it. It met life-threatening and feckless disorder with personal discipline and collective ecstasy. Then comes the metaphor, quote, what happened following the explosive starburst at the end of the trail in Los Angeles in 1906, and equally following all the other parallel starbursts worldwide, was a hurling of people in every direction, carrying with them a fusion of the faith of culturally despised poor blacks with that of culturally despised poor whites. And he sees this as a, an interracial um, junction box of uh, Hispanics, um, African Americans, and lower class whites. The picture is of a, is of a crescendo um, uh, to a fireworks display when rockets from different sources explode in bright lights and send countless smoky streamers ending in, ending in infinite numbers of other starbursts. This image has also been employed to illustrate multiple new expressions and new locations of Pentecostalism right down through the 20th century, which cannot reasonably be attributed to a singular Big Bang theory of global Pentecostalism, but rather to a string of firecrackers with each new bang separated from the others in time and space and representing a diffusive center for new Pentecostal charismatic ideas or practices. Now, all metaphors have their limits, and this one is no exception. What the burgeoning literature on global Pentecostal shows beyond dispute is that it is no longer possible to claim that the Azusa Street revival in Los Angeles in 1906 is somehow the node in the nucleus from which all subsequent Pentecostal expressions in their dazzling complexity derived. Now, what's at stake here? If you were to go and look at, let's say, the Wikipedia webpage in Pentecostalism, you will still have the Azusa Street revival as really the node and the center from which everything else moved. Now, there are lots of scholars now outside um, European and American Christianity who see that as a version of American imperialism and are increasingly keen to see um, different nodes and nuclei uh, 
of Pentecostal explosion in different parts of the world, especially those parts of the world where Pentecostalism is growing with really remarkable speed. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, um, uh, Southeast Asia, um, in, in other words, the global south. In his helpful synthesis of scholarship and global Pentecostalism to the ends of the earth, Pentecostalism and the transformation of world Christianity, Alan Anderson shows that although the Azusa Street Revival was the most significant North American center of early Pentecostalism, it was neither the only one nor the earliest. There were various revivals in different parts of the world throughout the 19th century and in the critical first decade of the 20th century, which displayed decidedly Pentecostal characteristics with gifts of the spirit like healings, tongues, prophecy, and other miraculous signs. Anderson documents many localized revivals in different parts of the world in which spiritual gifts were manifested, including those associated with the Tamil evangelist John Christian Arlupin in Tamil Nadu and others in 19th century Russia, Armenia, and Estonia. Contemporary with the Azusa Street Revival, but starting earlier and not directly influenced by it, there was tongue speaking and prophesying in the Mukti revival associated with Pandita Ramabai um, in India, which in turn was influenced by the Australian revival of 1903 and the Welsh revival of 1904 and 05. Within a decade of Azusa Street, there were revivals with Pentecostal characteristics, but without known direct contact with Los Angeles in places as far apart as Korea, China, India, Chile, Nigeria, and the Ivory Coast. All this leads Anderson to conclude that Pentecostal origins are complex and varied, polycentric and diffused. For these reasons, the burgeoning scholarship on global Pentecostalism, which according to some estimates embraces around half a billion people and probably over 700 different religious denominations, is appropriately wary of ceding hegemonic bragging rights to specific historical events on the west coast of the United States in the first decade of the 20th century. Pentecostalism became a global phenomenon, partly because of its ability to adapt to local cultures in Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Asia. In the same century, and for some of the same reasons, that Western imperialism, whether in its political or missionary versions, was coming under sustained opposition. Pentecostalism didn't draw all its energy from anti-colonial animus, but it could not have expanded so rapidly or established such deep roots without adaptation, indigenization, and acculturation in the age of decolonization. Adaptation and evolution, as with the coronaviruses with which we have now become all too familiar, produce endless new variants as host cultures reshape the DNA of the Pentecostal phenomenon. As its hugely variegated global expansion has demonstrated, Pentecostalism is eclectic, dynamic, pluralistic, and vociferous. Indeed, Martin saw many parallels between Pentecostalism and the Methodist and holiness traditions out of which it grew, including its capacity for schism and its tendency towards bureaucratization in its more established strongholds. But in essence, Pentecostalism is not a church or any kind of system, but is a repertoire of recogni recognizable spiritual affinities. This is, these are Martin's words. Um, it's a repertoire of recognizable spiritual affinities which constantly breaks out in new forms and in new places, which gives it the capacity to break the molds, above all in the huge populations of the non-Western world, especially the huge mega cities. The last phrase is important because Martin was convinced that classical Pentecostalism is unlikely ever to be a major power in the developed world because it represents the mobilization of a minority of people at the varied margins of, of that world whereas in the, the developing world it represents the mobilization of large masses of the population. Now, while it's important not to overstate the importance of Azusa Street as the foundational node of the worldwide Pentecostal phenomenon, for all of the reasons already alluded to, and it would suit my argument if it was, but, um, but honesty is honesty. Um, um, uh, it is also unwise, however, to understate the uh, influence uh, of Azusa Street. The various links in the chain of transmission of, of ideas connecting spirit baptism and tongue speaking, arguably the foundational nucleus of Pentecostalism, as conceived by these two men, Charles Fox Parham, and their application by the African-American preacher William Seymour at Azusa Street, 
are relatively well known. But the chain would not exist without the populist evangelical networks forged by Methodist holiness and healing preachers, Bible schools, missionary training institutes, premillennial pundits, female leaders, some of whom have left traces while others have not. Moreover, Azusa Street was important for its melding of religious influences from African Americans, Native Americans, lower class whites and Latino migrants. It became the most prominent center of American classical Pentecostalism, partly because of its multiracial identity and partly because of the influence of Seymour's periodical, The Apostolic Faith, which achieved an international circulation of over 50,000 people at its peak in 1908. Azusa Street also attracted large numbers of religious sightseers of varying degrees of influence and prolifically sent out missionaries to over 25 countries in only two years. You can draw these diagrams, these network diagrams from Azusa Street to so many origin stories. Azusa Street and the other Los Angeles satellites associated with it were not the only places on the North American continent where the spirit touched down in the first decade of the 20th century. There were other important early centers in New York, Chicago, and, Ch and Toronto. Nor should it be regarded as causative or normative for Pentecostalism's global spread, but its role as a multiracial multi epicenter of the manifestation of spiritual gifts to quite humble people became important even as a foundation myth for Pentecostalism's multifaceted global expansion. And that foundation myth, I think, is still important. Nevertheless, Azusa was the premier fountain for sending out missionaries who circled the globe surprisingly qu quickly. One of the reasons for this expansionist energy was the notion, almost unique to Azusa, that sometimes glossolalia was claimed to be xenolalia. In other words, tongue speaking could be translatable into any language anywhere. And therefore, why spend months studying language at the University of Edinburgh if it can just come directly to you? And there's not a lot of, tr um, to my knowledge, um, uh, there, there are not a, a lot of verifiable um, uh, uh, examples where glossolalia did become xenolalia. One aspect of Pentecostalism, which, which it shares with some earlier feature of the, features of the Protestant International, is the importance of women as organizers, funders, and sustainers of family values and domestic disciplines against potential male flirtations with the sins of the flesh, sex, and alcohol. Pentecostalism, like Methodism before, it was predominantly a woman's movement, even if women were rarely given access to leadership positions or established pulpits. And I'll be saying a little bit more about the Glow Fellowship, which is one of the largest women's organizations in the world, which is a Pentecostal organization of women. And I'll be speaking about that on tomorrow night. Following the early women leaders of Pentecostalism tells one a great deal about the formal and informal networks of where the movement came from and how it developed. Of the 12 apostles who acted as a committee to license missionaries coming out of the Azusa Street Revival, seven were women and two were black. And women were often the pioneer missionaries in different parts of the world. Some of the biographies of preeminent women like Pandita Ramabai, founder of the Mukti Mission in India, are well known. But the life story of her close associate, Minnie Abrams, is yet more revealing of the networks. A classic example of the trajectory from the women's missionary movement through holiness to Pentecostalism, Abrams was born in Wisconsin, attended the Methodist-related Chicago Training School for Home and Foreign Missions, Abrams went to India as a missionary of the Methodist Episcopal Church in 1887 and left that position a decade later to work with the Mukti Mission in Karaon. As awareness spread of the 1904 Welsh Revival among mission statements, a Pentecostal revival began at the Mukti Mission in the summer of 1905, the year before the Azusa Street Revival. Abrams brought together her holiness, spirituality, missionary experience, and spirit baptism in her book called The Baptism of the Holy Ghost, which, the, which, through primarily female networks, became an important shaper of Pentecostal mission theory, directly influencing the rise of Pentecostalism in Chile and other Pentecostal missions in China and Liberia. Unfortunately, as with an earlier generation of female preachers within Methodism, once Pentecostalism was organized into denominations, formal leadership passed over to men. But in this pioneer phase, 
Pentecost Pentecostalism afforded new opportunities for women in leadership, partly because of its emphasis on the power of the Spirit, which gave women a biblical rationale for cross-cultural evangelism and leadership, even in periods of time when the forces of fundamentalism and routinization tried to restrict the role of women. I'm arguing that Minnie Abrams has a traceable life because of the institution she uh, went through and because of the book she wrote. But there are dozens and hundreds and thousands of women who traverse these networks, um, uh, not as famous as Minnie Abrams. In conclusion then, what do we learn about the Protestant International through its networks, nodes, and nuclei? The first and most important is the, the centrality of the Bible and the divergent exegeses and novel theological constructions that came from reading it as a direct revelation of divine intentions for all humans. From the Reformation Anabaptists through the dispensational premillennialists to the Pentecostal enthusiasts, the Bible was the window into the primitive church, the sword for resisting Christendom's elites, and the key to unlocking the secrets of time and eternity. Second is the importance of transnational and transdenominational networks that do not easily give up their secrets unless embedded in institutions, publications, and correspondence. Yet these networks existed both formally and informally. Third is the impact of ubiquitous, mostly lay-led voluntary societies and organizations and the influence of print culture in its manifold iterations, periodicals, tracts, pamphlets, and books. In the 20th century, print culture was to some extent overtaken by radio and TV as the most significant bearers of the communication channels of popular Protestant transmission. And they are now being overtaken by social media and the digital revolution. Popular Protestantism has been remarkably uh, innovative in using um, technology. Fourth is the reality that many of the most influential shapers of Protestantism over the past half a millennium started as critiques of the worldliness and pastoral mediocrity of established churches and denominations, as insufficiently pure, zealous, or attentive to primitive Christianity. These are revival movements. Fifth, the Protestant International has had an ambivalent relationship with its sur surrounding cultural context. On the one hand, it benefited from some of the most powerful cultural sh shapers of the early modern and modern eras, including liberal capitalism, the rise of Protestant empires, and innovations in transport and technology. While on the other, there's been a relentless critique of cultural sins and a profound pessimism about the state of the world and where it's headed. Sixth, women are important to the whole enterprise and almost always comprise the majority of all popular Protestant communities. But they generally exercise more leadership at the beginning of new directions and at their end, when males create organizational structures and property trusts to maintain their control. Seventh, a nucleus of powerful ideas or means has supplied a kind of nuclear fission in unleashing expansive energy. These include ideas such as the evangelistic commission to take the gospel into all the world, or the belief in a physical second coming of Jesus around which the history of time is organized, or that through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, unlimited divine power lies in the hands of all true believers. These ideas are no mere theological propositions, around which orthodoxy is negotiated, but operate as powerful incentives to change the world. Eighth, populist Protestant traditions, because of their open access to biblical interpretation, their critique of elite-run denominations, and their inexhaustible adaptation to fresh cultural settings, are notoriously vociferous and vulnerable to power contests between authoritarian male leaders. Ninth, in the transmission of new theological ideas and forms of religious expression, it's important to pay attention to nodes and junction boxes, particular geographical or cultural sites which supply the electrical energy in the transmission grid of international Protestantism. Finally, none of the transformations dealt with in this lecture can be understood without a deep understanding of the economic, social, and political conditions which shape them. In that sense, the Protestant International is both a cause and a consequence of the increasing globalization of the modern era in all its complexity. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Hepton, for a magisterial account of uh, the scene that you give us of the Protestant International. Um, 
you used the word, or the word nature occurred once, right at the beginning, um, on the hexagon, the Ward's hexagon, and basically you said the, uh, this notion of nature, uh, vitalist approach to nature, disappeared. Um, it seems to me, after this lecture, that the whole thing you've described, when it's looked at from a contemporary standpoint, is a 250-year catastrophe in terms of environmental and ecological degradation. And in the, as it were, in terms of the remit of Lord Gifford, is this anything more than something a profound theology of anti-nature? Mm. Yeah, what a, what a great question. Um, um, and yeah, I'd say a couple of things. One is that, um, you know, the very conventional um, uh, theological definition of evangelicalism never mention n n nature. They're, they're, they're a set of theological propositions. Ward did come across through his uh, researches in um, predominantly German and Central European pietism and this notion of a vitalist concept of nature that somehow the divine was not just recognizable through the natural world, but somehow divine energy propelled the natural world in all its activities so that there's something vital going on. Um, that did get exercised a little bit, or considerably, frankly, from the... Um, but even I had a doctoral student, uh, um, you know, Brett Granger, who just you know, did a very fine PhD on evangelicals and nature and natural spaces, really arguing that evangelicals paid more attention to nature and nature spaces throughout their history than historians have ever paid attention to. So what you might be describing is not only a theological disease, it may be a, a historiographical disease as well. Um, and that it, it, it's time, I think, uh, when that can be uh, uh, put back together again. That's a great question. There's one here. Hi, um, thank you. My name's Tom Bortigam. I'm a doctoral student here. Um, I was just wanting to ask a question, particularly about point nine and ten on your on your conclusions there, um, and this, the model of, of networks, nodes, and nuclei, which which works really well for the Christian networks. That intersection with political networks, and the extent to which the two kind of, not to stretch the metaphor, but become kind of symbiotic um, in their use of networks and in their in their use of of kind of nodes. Can we can we track those those ideas where the political network will be piggybacking on to the religious network for the, for the structure. I mean, the Book of Daniels is so, is so kind of, not anti-monarchical, but, but un unpicks monarchical power. Do, they, do we see the sharing of political and religious nodal areas and one group using the other to transport its ideas across continents or, or transatlantic? Or, or is, is that something that is common or not? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, just off the top of my head, there are certainly piles of examples where um, political elites of one kind or another uh, wake up to the power of some of these networks and know how to utilize them. I mean, it, this is definitely true of the Reagan revolution, for example, in the Republican Party, and it's definitely true right up to the present in American politics. There are other examples of it as well, you know, going back in time. Um, I, I do think, and of course, empire itself and the political extension of empire it, you know, does have a symbiotic relationship with these re religious um, uh, networks. Some would not have been opened up without imperial conquest. Some would not have operated the way they did without, even though the, the connection between you know, you know, hard and fast commercial imperialists and religious missionaries and so on is always more tense than sometimes you might imagine. Um, I prefer to see, you know, I think politics is one framing of it. I think, um, uh, you know, social and economic conditions is another framing of it in, in the sense that politics also has to mirror social and economic realities, especially, you know, as democratization um, moves forward. But I, you know, as a social historian, I look more for those social and economic bedrocks, occupational structures, um, um, transport networks, um, uh, um, um, uh, you know, 
regional uh, mobilities, you know, so I, uh, they are more important, I think, to me than the, the political network. So um, I could see how a political historian could, could make quite a lot of this material. There's a question here, yeah, just at the front. Sorry for keeping you a bit later tonight. This was the most tricky lecture to condense because of the three big things. Um, things will get a little more, anyway. You, you, you paint a picture of the, of the astonishing energy of, of Pentecostalism and its, and its huge uh, appeal to diverse populations. To what extent is this basically driven by a reaction against the modernity of the, of the Enlightenment of the, of the 18th century playing through and the, and the, and the, and the people that, as it were, get the, get, get the, get the thick end of modernity? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, it, it, it's one that um, really exercised uh, Reg Ward as an old primitive Methodist. Um, his definition of enlightenment was the means and a way to a better life. The means and a way to a better life. And he saw these populist evangelicals, and he didn't write much about Pentecostalism, but I think he would be in sympathy with David Martin's view that that Pentecostalism is a means and a way to a better life for, for many people. Uh, I mean, some of it is prosperity gospel and fake healing, not you know, built around showboat characters who milk their congregations for all they can. So some of it is, is, is shoddy. But quite a lot of it is, is uh, um, around uh, women's uh, 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 role in trying to construct a decent, disciplined life against, um, as, as populations migrate into cities, to keep men away from uh, alcohol, drugs, um, sex, um, a whole bunch of things that lead to family breakdown. And so from that point of view, it could be seen as a form of enlightenment. Um, um, Obviously, if one was to apply elite theological, you know, categories, it's, you know, somewhat unsophisticated in terms of systematic theology and all of that. Um, and, you know, the two things that really hold Pentecostalism together are interesting to me. One is um, the kind of faith healing. So it's that power over the, the, the worst things of life. Um, 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 and the other is this baptism of the Holy Spirit or direct divine empowerment. I mean, what a powerful idea that the Spirit of God lives within you and you can do things. Um, so uh, so I, I think you could either turn it into an anti-enlightenment narrative or you could turn it into almost a paradoxical enlightenment narrative as a means and a way to a better life. Make, we'll make this the last question at the back. Yeah. Two more, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for the uh, amazing lecture. Professor, in light of today's uh, lectures, like, uh, can we say uh, that religious networks moved in search of markets or did market forces find the network? So that was what I was thinking when you uh, talked about religion and capitalism or, um, and how the uh, itinerant preaching had taken place in search of pietism and all uh, that. So um, that was one thing. So to what extent can we measure the relevance of market influence in evangelism today or in the contemporary causes? Yeah, yeah, they're tough questions in a way. They're good, they're good questions. Um, I, I think what's very striking to me about these populist movements, right from pietism through evangelicalism, fundamentalism into Pentecostalism, and I think Professor Brown mentioned this at an earlier lecture, is just how savvy they are about using um, latest technologies constructed by markets, um, whether it's uh, print, um, uh, radio was huge for uh, uh, Pentecostalism, uh, TV was is huge for this global spread and 
um, you know, right across the world, plugging into these, you know, sometimes prosperity gospel networks and so on that they're not particularly exciting. Um, and then right up to the present, you know, where the social media, if you look at how some of these big Pentecostal churches in sub-Saharan Africa are mobilizing um, technology in their global spread back out from uh, centers, uh, you know, of Ni like Nigeria. Um, uh, or the whole, I mentioned this, you know, music recording industry and popular praise music and the markets that come with that, you know, that literature that's being disseminated and the songs and the copyrights and the money that's being generated. Like these are big things, you know, so there is a real connection between the market and, um, and, and, and these um, uh, uh, populist Protestant things. Um, I've forgotten the second part of your question, um, but... No, um, it was just the same. It's, it's kind of like, uh, could we measure it today, like in the sense that uh, I was thinking that it stabilizes and destabilizes state institutions, like, uh, or how do we bring a equilibrium where markets don't influence much, or how do we do that? Yeah, uh, well, I, I, I suppose as a slightly pessimistic economic historian, I do think that markets influence a very great deal um, of, uh, of how the modern world works and is likely to do so for a very long time. And um, um, uh, so I, I think that's just, you know, uh, Adam Smith changed the landscape. I blame, blame the Scottish Enlightenment for that one. <laughs> um, um, but... Um, but these are really interesting questions to me because I, I, I do think, um, you know, what we're getting to in these lectures a little bit is that um, I, I think if the nucleus nodes and, uh, uh, and networks idea works for this material, which I think it sort of does, it's not, you know, I mean, I, there are limitations to it, but I do think this, this is a helpful framing. Um, uh, then the, the next stage in thinking about it is the kind of, are the kinds of questions that are coming up here. You know, how does it relate to nature? How does it relate to political structures? How does it relate to economic structures and free markets? How does it relate to, you know, all the, to, flow, to diaspora studies, um, which is, a, as you know, a big thing now and, uh, 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 as well. And these all add levels. And, and similarly, you know, some people ask questions about music and that's or technology or whatever. And, so there's infinite ways you can you, you draw this out. The, the, the important thing is not to get to the position that, that Professor Brown was guarding me against in a previous question, is that like, what exactly is not a network in, in, in this scheme? You know, is this, a, this is something I mentioned in the first lecture, that it, it can be a kind of, if you're not careful, overload into vacuousness, which is why I'm keen in, in like tonight's lecture, which is a little bit long, but it's really important, I think, to get a sense of the, you know, the, the conferences, the print, the transmission of ideas, the, the uh, pamphlets, the journals, the, um, you know, all of those uh, uh, transmissions, which I think are really important. Um, but, um, and we'll see a little bit more how this works tomorrow night. Um, and, the, and the following one, you know, when I look harder at digital and social media in the modern world and what that's doing to, you know, how do we think about that in, in, in this framing? Um, so, uh, so my defense is that I've got more to say, <laughs> unfortunately for you. <laughs> well, with that, let's, uh, let's call this evening's lecture to a halt. David, thank you very much for a great lecture and for both stimulating and then responding to a really broad range of questions from the audience. Uh, for everybody whose appetite is wet for more, uh, please come back tomorrow uh, at 5.30 in the same time. But until then, David, congratulations and thank you very much. Thank you.